sleep to me, I think, is the elixir of life. It is your life support system. And as best we can tell, I would argue it's Mother Nature's best effort yet at immortality. And so in that regard, that's why I, when I look across all of the studies and all of the data, it's so compelling to me. And part of the reason I think it's, I've desperately tried and I haven't done a good job, but I've tried to offer some public mission of reuniting humanity with the sleep that it's so bereft of is because it does appear that there is a global sleep loss epidemic. If you look at the numbers, people are struggling so desperately with their sleep. So we have all of this knowledge, this incredible knowledge of sleep and how important it is. And it's a perfect storm colliding with this great sleep depression in modern society. And for that reason, I just felt as though, what can I do to try to help offer this voice and this science? And I am but a scientist and I stand on the shoulders of all of my colleagues and all of these giants in the field. I'm just a researcher. So that's a little bit about, I guess, who I am, but more about why I do it and why I think it's important. And at that point, I started to think, well, so then what is this thing called sleep? And what I learned is that some of the greatest minds in the past hundred years had tried to answer a very simple question. Why do we sleep? And, you know, 30 years ago, in fact, the crass answer was that we sleep to cure sleepiness. <laughs> Which tells you nothing about, you know, it's like saying, I eat to cure hunger. Well, no, you that's not the right answer. Now, 30 years later, we've had to upend the question. And we now have to ask, is there any physiological system in your body? Is there any operation of your mind that isn't wonderfully enhanced when you get sleep or demonstrably impaired when you don't get enough? And the answer seems to be to be no there. So my journey into the science of sleep really was an accident. But at that moment in time, when I started reading about sleep, I utterly fell in love with the topic. And it is a love affair that has lasted me over 20 years. I think it is the most beguiling topic in all of science. I'm biased, of course. Um, and I will never study anything different. I know that now. I'll study it to the end of my career and until the end of my life. Sleep is utterly idiotic because when you're sleeping, Firstly, you're not finding a mate, you're not reproducing, you're not foraging for food, you're not caring for your young, and worst of all, you're vulnerable to predation. <laughs> now, on any one of those grounds, but especially all of them as a collective, sleep should have been strongly selected against during the course of evolution. But from best we can tell, sleep evolved with life itself on this planet, and it is fought its way through heroically every step along the evolutionary path. And what that has told us is that sleep must be essential at the most basic of biological levels. And now we understand that Mother Nature didn't make a spectacular blunder with this thing called sleep. Sleep, for example, will restock the weaponry in your immune arsenal and it will make you a more immune sensitive individual. So you're more immune robust when you wake up. We also know that it regulates your blood sugar levels. It controls your appetite hormones. It also regulates your sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen. Um, sleep upstairs within the brain will fixate memories and help you learn and remember. Sleep will deescalate anxiety. It will reduce your emotional difficulties and traumas. Sleep will actually cleanse away the Alzheimer's toxic proteins that build up in the brain. You know, the, the list is endless. These are all of the reasons that we need to sleep because we are a tribe species. Now, there is something else that we call your chronotype. Are you a morning type, evening type, or somewhere in between? And by the way, you don't get to decide. It's not your choice, you know, this notion of, these go-getter type A's who say everyone has to be awake at five in the morning. You know, you go to the gym, you blast out a workout for an hour and you're at the desk by 6 a.m. Um, you have no choice. If you're an evening type, you're an evening type. It's hard-coded. We know that right now there's at least 22 different genes that dictate 
what you are, morning type, evening type, or somewhere in between. And it's about a third, third split across the population. Why is it a split? Why are we nicely spread out across our chronotypes? For exactly the reason you described. Because when we're in a tribe, if we all sleep at the same time, we're all vulnerable for eight hours. But if you were to insert some genetic variability into when people have a desire to sleep, you've got the morning types who maybe go to bed at 9 p.m. and are waking up, let's say, at 5 a.m. And then you've got all of the extreme evening types who are going to bed at 2 a.m. and waking up at maybe 11 or midday. So that way, the everyone gets their eight hours of sleep. But the entire tribe, the nucleus of this group of Homo sapiens themselves, is only vulnerable for maybe just two or three hours. So it's a clever solution that Mother Nature has come up with to say everyone gets their eight hours, but as a species, you're only going to be vulnerable for two to three hours max when everyone, at least as a collective, is sleeping. Absolute genius. The, uh, a book uh, that was called Why We Sleep back in probably about 2014 or 15. And at that point, sleep was the neglected stepsister in the health conversation of that day. You know, we were speaking a lot about diet and exercise, which was wonderful, but there was no voice of sleep. And I was so sad about that because I could see so much disease and suffering that was coming so clearly by way of a lack of sleep, but it wasn't there on the public buffet menu for consumption of knowledge. And so that was part of the motivation for trying to write the book. So I would say now, and this is not because of me or the book or anything like that, but is, is sleep more of a conversation in this day and age than it was six or seven years ago? I think I would say yes, there is a greater awareness of, of sleep. Um, but with that awareness, I, want, I think one can still question the pragmatics, meaning just because we're talking about it more does not mean that people are still failing to either get the sleep that they need or that they are unable to get the sleep that they need. And those two things are different. One is that you are healthy and you can generate the sleep that you need, but you don't give yourself the opportunity time or life, I should say sometimes, because it's sometimes not your choice. Life does not give you the chance to get sleep. And if only you had the chance, you could sleep. That's one version. The second version is, no, I'm giving myself the right opportunity to sleep, but because I'm anxious or because of other issues, I am not able to generate sleep. I suffer from insomnia and sleep problems. So those two things I don't see having changed since you know i think this public movement this increasing movement of sleep conversation came on the table so in that regard i'm more pessimistic than i am optimistic and i think it will only get worse if you look at rates of insomnia for example they're only increasing they're only escalating rates of anxiety disorders the very same thing and those two things are intimately intertwined so i think I wish I my mission was extinguished within the next couple of years because society started sleeping wonderfully well. I don't think that's going to be the case, so I think I've got my work cut out for me. To think about sleep as a biological process, and it very much is, and but also it's so environmental as well as biological, meaning when you were to say, you know, how did you sleep last night? Think about all of the external factors that changed it. Well, I had to be up at this time. I had to catch the flight this time. My partner went to bed at this time and she woke up at this time. There was this noise that sort of happened. I'm now sleeping in a hotel room. You know, there are countless externalities and those externalities are shaped by this thing called the modern world. And in the modern world, if I could really be cynical, and I'm not someone, I'm very optimistic and I'm very non-cynical, but you could argue from a capitalistic standpoint that society does not want you sleeping because what society wants from a capitalistic point of view is that you're either producing or you're consuming. And when you're sleeping, you're neither producing and you're neither consuming. And so there are lots of ways that I think society and the modern world has conspired willfully or not 
conspiratorially or not, to decrease and try to diminish sleep. In fact, I think the CEO of Netflix several years ago, and I'm sure the YouTube comments will correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe his very statement was that we are, we are deciding to commit war against sleep. That was their wow. goal. And it just stunned me that, you know, that we're going to go to war with sleep. We're going to remove you from your sleep. So there are lots of ways in, in which I think society does not help us. Light is another good example. We are a dark deprived society in this modern era because we're exposed to light. We are not giving ourselves the right temperature cues. You know, we go into an office where it's, you know, 20 degrees, 70 degrees Celsius, whatever it is, stock stable. Then we come home and we regulate our temperature at home to be the same thing. We take on board probably too much caffeine in this day and age, although I am actually an advocate of drinking coffee and I can explain why too. But anxiety, as I said, is a huge issue. All of these things are preventing and classic roadblocks to sleep. Uh, here in the United States, the average amount of sleep that people are getting is uh, six hours and uh, 29 minutes. In the UK, it's not much better, six hours and 49 minutes. Japan was the worst, six hours and 22 minutes. Now, to be clear, that's the average. What that means is that there is still a large proportion of that bell-shaped distribution of people getting even less than that amount. Now, there are some countries that you look at um, that are actually sleeping much better than that. Uh, I think um, Mexico, for example, is, um, is doing very well. If you look at Mexico City, uh, people are actually sleeping uh, not too far off from eight hours. So there is variability and we can try to understand why, which by the way, just brings me back while I think about it to your comment of will my work be done? Not from the, because I'm a scientist and I do, I have a, run a big sleep center at UC Berkeley, but the work I do as a hopefully a public advocate for sleep why I don't think it's going to change um, anytime soon is because governments aren't really doing much about it. And I've tried as best I can. And if there is any government out there that listens to this, that wants to work with me, I'd be delighted. I don't remember, and maybe you can, but any major first world nation government that has had a public health campaign regarding sleep. And it stuns me because those same governments have had public health campaigns regarding, you know, eating, regarding smoking, regarding drunk driving, regarding risky behaviors, safe sex, loneliness, mental health, suicide. Where is sleep in that equation? And it's such a fundamental ingredient. And in fact, almost all of those things that I've just described have an intimate relationship with sleep. I mean, suicide, especially, we were starting to do a lot of work with this, although it's been hard to get funding. But what we found is that insufficient sleep is a precursor to suicide. That sleep disruption seems to predict both suicide ideation, in other words, suicidal thinking, suicide planning, and tragically, suicide completion as well. So if we were to try to have governments create a public health campaign to pull this Archimedes lever on better sleep, there are so many other health benefits. You know, sleep is the tide that rises all the other health boats. It's almost like a, it's like a mixing deck in a studio, you know, in those sound studios where you've seen it. And then there's that one button all the way to the end, the white button, sort of that when you move it up, Sort of all of the other dials, the sort of the red, yellow, orange, green dials, they all move up at the same time as well. There's this like sort of one mess, there's like one ring to rule them all. Sleep is that Archimedes lever. So if governments could only execute on that, the health benefits would be manifold in terms of their consequences. Why is it that we are struggling to get sleep? And there is no single answer. There are so many different reasons. And that's why it's actually a very challenging problem to solve, I would go through a descending level of steps. So first I would start at the government level and we would get those public health campaigns in order. 
Um, next, I would go to the professional level because there we have this mentality in business that, you know, sleep is for the soft among us, that less sleep equals more productivity. And that is just not true. And I can provide you with all of the evidence. So we need to get rid of this sort of sleep machismo attitude in the workplace where we wear our badge of honor of sleep deprivation on our arms. We need to get companies to actually start embracing sleep. And I can guarantee you and I can give you all of the evidence as to why if as a company, as a CEO, if you start prioritizing the sleep of your employees, you will be far better off as a company. You will be more product based and you will be more profitable and revenue generating. Sleep is the very best form of physiologically injected venture capital that you could ever wish for. And in fact, the RAND Corporation, which is an independent survey corporation, what they found is that at a national level, insufficient sleep costs most nations about 2% of their GDP. So here in America, that number was $411 billion of lost profit caused by insufficient sleep. In the United Kingdom, it was over $50 billion. In Japan, it was over $120 billion. If I could solve the sleep loss crisis in the workplace, I could perhaps double the healthcare benefit for many of those countries, or I could halve the, el the education deficit in those countries. So the next level I would target is at business. Then next step down would be medicine. Medicine is a classic demonstration here. We have junior doctors, or here in America, they have doctor residency programs where people are working 20, 30 hour shifts. And so already doctors are inculcated into the mindset of the uselessness of, of sufficient sleep across numerous countries. And I think it was maybe over eight different countries. We looked at the medical curricula and we asked how many hours of education do doctors get about sleep? And what's strange is that, you know, often doctors, you go in and you'll have an appointment, they'll say, okay, you know, how are you eating? And you know, what's going on with the, the bathroom? How's the toilet? Um, and then, you know, how are you sleeping? As if sleep is one of these universal health barometers. But what we found is that most doctors will only be given about an hour to an hour and a half of sleep education during their entire medical school education which blows my mind because it is one third of their patients' lives, but they're only given about 90 minutes of education. So no wonder your doctors aren't treating your sleep problems, thinking about your sleep problems, understanding your sleep, it's not their fault. And plus they're sleep deprived anyway when they're being trained. Ironically, by the way, doctors, junior doctors who've worked a 30 hour shift when they finish that 30 hour shift and get back in their car, they are 168% more likely to get into a car accident because of their lack of sleep and end back up in the emergency room from where they were just working. But now as a patient, I mean, this, the paradox, the irony just stuns me. So I would next move down to the level of medicine. Then I would go to education because we don't get taught about sleep in schools. You know, I never got one of those special classes. You know, I got sort of, you know, sexual education classes, classes about drugs. No one came in and told me about the benefits of sleep. Why aren't we doing that? Then next, I would move down into the family because there is prejudice in families with sleep. It's this notion of parents of teenagers and these teenagers, by the way, it's not their fault. They have a shift in their chronotype, in their circadian rhythm, that when they go through puberty, when they're going through adolescence, they get fast forwarded in time. So when they were eight or nine years old, they would be going to bed, you know, sort of early in the evening. But now as teenagers, they seem to be stubborn and they're staying awake, staying awake until midnight, 1 a.m. and they won't get into bed. It is not their fault because they have a biologically wired shift in their tendency of when they want to wake up and when they want to sleep. Why am I bringing this up about this sort of mismanagement in the home? Because parents at weekends will go into the room of the teenagers, they'll you know pull open the, the curtains, they will pull the covers off hmm. and they say, you're wasting the day. You know, and firstly, what they're doing is probably 
trying to sleep off a debt that we've lumbered them with during the week because of this incessant model of early school start times, which I'll, I'll come back to. But within the home, if you ask parents of teenagers, what percent of parents think that their teenagers are getting sufficient sleep? And about 70% of them will say, yes, my teenager is getting sufficient sleep. When you look at the data, only about 15% of teenagers are actually getting the sleep that they need. So what happens is a parent to child transmission of sleep neglect. They're saying you're lazy, you're slothful. So then what happens? Well, in 15, 20 years time, now that teenager has got a teenage child. What do they do? They go back in the room, they rip the curtains open, they say you're wasting the day because that's what they were told. So we need to break that down too. And then finally, we need to come to the individual and we need to solve the individual's sleep problems. So it's a very long answer and I'm desperately sorry. Companies like Google or Facebook, they understand the pounds and pennies sense, you know, the dollars and the cents version of productivity. So anything that returns productivity, they will invest in. And some of those companies, you know, I, um, I did some work uh, at Google uh, during a sabbatical and there on their campus, they will have these nap pods and they will have these what are called shh rooms where you can go and you can take a nap. So think about 20 years ago, you would never imagine a company paying you to sleep on the job. If you were caught sleeping on the job, you'd probably be fired. Now companies are incentivizing it, not because they are thinking compassionately or empathetically about the health or the wellness of their individuals. It is because they understand that it transacts marked productivity. Why we think that a lack of sleep does not equal more productivity is for at least five reasons. First, when you survey, and we we can do these studies in the, in the laboratory too, when you undersleep employees, they will choose less challenging problems. So if you give them an array of work problems, they will just simply, you know, check email, they'll listen to phone messages. They don't dig into deep project work. Second, of the problems that they do take on in their work, they will produce fewer creative solutions. And after all, creativity and ingenuity are supposed to be the two engines that drive businesses forward in terms of their productivity and their revenue. The third that, uh, interesting finding that we've discovered is that when underslept employees start working in teams, they will slack off. They won't do their work. They will let other people do their work. It's what we call social loafing. Hmm. So they ride the coattails of other people's hard work, which won't breed a good atmosphere in your company. You know, trust me. The fourth thing that we found is that underslept employees are more deviant that they're more likely to fudge data in spreadsheets. They're more likely to falsely claim uh, money for reimbursement. That was inappropriate. The final thing is that a lack of sleep will go all the way to the top of the business chain. What we found is that the more or less sleep that a business leader has had from one night to the next to the next, the more or less charismatic that employees will rate that business leader from one day to the next to the next. Even though the employees themselves, they know nothing about the sleep that that CEO has been getting. It's evidential in how charismatic that CEO is. So you can add all of these things up and no wonder you know, if you don't snooze, you lose in the case of business in that <laughs> regard. That's why I can produce I think a non-trivial case for business. By the way, the other aspect that is hugely costly to businesses, and when I go and speak to businesses about why they should value sleep, if you offer it on the grounds of, again, sort of compassion or mental health, you probably don't want to listen. When you convert it into the cost of the company and how much it's fleecing them in terms of their prof profits, then they start to pay attention. Underslept employees will take on average about 11 more days, uh, sick days throughout the year relative to well-slept individuals. So you're essentially just paying people additionally for 11 days of work that they will never give you when you are undersleeping them. Secondly, the utilization of healthcare resources increases by about 
So the cost to either you, the company here in the US, where your company is paying for your healthcare, or the cost to the government, for example, in the United Kingdom, is astronomical. And also then the co what we call comorbid diseases, your rates of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mental health conditions, all of these things escalate as underslept employees continue to get even more underslept. So there is no strong case that I've seen that leads me to think businesses should foster the mentality of insufficient sleep, quite the opposite. So that's ho hopefully an answer to your question. We can look at it bi-directionally. When we give sleep back, do you get productivity? Yes. When you take sleep away, do things implode rapidly? Yes. And is it costly to your company? Very much so. And what we found is that naps can transact some fantastic benefits. They can improve cardiovascular health, lower uh, blood pressure. They can improve your learning and memory abilities. They can reset the emotional north of your magnetic compass in a good way, where you can de-escalate negative emotions and increase positive emotions. Um, so naps certainly are a good thing, but with a big caveat that I'll come back to. For a nap, what we found is that you can get nice benefits for things like your learning and your memory, and it can even reduce some level of anxiety up to about 20 minutes. You can, in fact, you can nap. I think the study, one of the studies, they brought a nap down to about nine minutes in duration, and there was still some basic improvements for your sort of general level of alert, alertness and reaction time. For example, if you're an athlete, that's, that's non-trivial. So, um, so the reason I would say be careful with naps is for two main um, sort of suggestions. The first is try not to nap for about longer than 20 minutes because once you go past 20 minutes, you really start to go down into those deeper stages of non-REM sleep. And if you wake up after about 45 minutes or 60 minutes, it's not a problem. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't or you couldn't. I'm just saying be aware because when you come out of that deep sleep and you wake up from that deep sleep, normally that's not how you wake up. You will usually wake up out of lighter stages of sleep or out of REM sleep. It's rare that we wake up out of deep sleep. But if you nap and you nap for about 40 minutes, you'll probably go down into deep sleep. And at that point, if you wake up and your alarm goes off, then you're going to feel almost miserable and worse than you did before the nap because you have what's called sleep inertia, which is essentially a sleep hangover, where the brain is still sort of pulled back into that deep sleep state. And it can take you almost an hour before you feel like you're back up to operating temperature and you're up to motorway speed. So I would say keep it to 20 minutes and you don't suffer too much of that inertia. You still get some nice benefits. Also, don't nap too late in the afternoon. Also, the final part is if you are struggling with sleep at night, if you're someone who has insomnia or sleep difficulties, do not nap during the day. It's the worst thing that you can be doing because when we're awake during the day, we build up a sleepiness chemical in our brain. It's called adenosine. And the longer that we're awake, the more adenosine that builds up, the more adenosine that builds up, the sleepier and sleepier that we feel. And when we sleep, the brain gets the chance to clear away all of that adenosine, all of that sleepiness. And somewhere between seven to nine hours after sleeping a full night, the brain has evacuated all of that sleepiness chemical, all of that adenosine, so that then we should wake up and we should feel refreshed and restored and not needing caffeine to, to function. Why is that relevant to naps? Well, it's relevant to naps because when you take a nap, you're essentially, it's like a pressure valve on a cooker. You're just releasing some of that healthy sleepiness that you've been building up. And therefore, if you are struggling with sleep at night and then you nap during the day, it's terrible because you're taking away all of that healthy, good weight of sleepiness that we've been trying to build up on your shoulders to give you the best chance of a good night of sleep. That's why I would say if you are suffering from insomnia, don't nap during the day. Also, even if you are, if you don't struggle with sleep at night, try not to nap after about 3 p.m. in the afternoon or 2 p.m. 
Napping late in the afternoon or in the early evening, it's a little bit like snacking before your main meal. It just takes the appetite off your sleep hunger, so try not to do that. But naps, for the most part, if you don't struggle with sleep, they are wonderful things. Just keep in mind the 20 minute sort of idea. Um, caffeine will hurt your sleep in probably at least three ways, some of which you most people are not aware of. The first issue is the duration of its action. So caffeine has what we call a half-life of about five to six hours. In other words, after about five to six hours, half of that caffeine is still in your system. What that means is that caffeine has a quarter life of somewhere between 10 to 12 hours. So if you have a cup of coffee at noon, at midday, a quarter of that caffeine is still in your brain at midnight. So having a cup of coffee at noon, and it's hyperbole in truth, probably, or it's a little bit hyperbolic, but it's almost the equivalent of a coffee at noon is the equivalent of, you know, tucking yourself into bed. And just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of coffee and you hope for a good night of sleep. <laughs> and it's probably not going to happen. So that's the first thing to keep in mind is the, the timing of, of caffeine. The second is that caffeine is a stimulant. Now, everyone knows this. Everyone knows that caffeine can make you more alert and more awake. By the way, how does it do that? Um, it comes back to adenosine, which is the chemical that we spoke about, the sleepiness chemical. It's no coincidence that those two things sound the same at the end of the name, caffeine and adenosine. Caffeine will actually race into your brain and it will latch on to the adenosine receptors, the welcome sites in your brain. And it has very sharp elbows and it will force away the adenosine from those receptors and it will hijack those receptors. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, well, hang on a second. If it's latching onto those sleepiness chemical receptors, shouldn't caffeine make you more sleepy? And the answer is no, because what it does is it just latches onto the receptor and it inactivates it, essentially. So it masks the receptor what caffeine does then is race into your brain. You've got all of this sleepiness at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. You have an espresso because you're trying to power through and finish the report or you know the presentation for your sort of your pitch uh, for your deck for your startup company. And that caffeine races in. It latches onto the adenosine receptors and blocks the signal of adenosine. So now your brain was thinking, I'm starting to get tired. It's 10 p.m. But now, all of a sudden, that signal is blocked. And a caffeine is like hitting the mute button on your television remote controller. It just mutes the signal of sleepiness. So now you think, well, no, I don't feel sleepy anymore. And here's the danger that even though, well, when the caffeine is in your system and it's latched onto the receptors, that adenosine is still there. It's not going away. In fact, if anything, during the course of the caffeine in your system, it continues to build and build. And now when the caffeine finally gets metabolized and excreted out of your system, not only do you go back to the sleepiness that you had many hours before, it's that plus all of the adenosine sleepiness that's been building up during that time in between. So you get hit with this huge tsunami wave of sleepiness, and that's what we call the caffeine crash. So the one of the issues, so that's sort of caffeine in terms of how it works and its timing. Another issue is that it creates anxiety and anxiety is probably one of the greatest enemies of sleep it's one of the principal reasons that underlies insomnia is a physiological state of anxiety that your fight or flight branch of the nervous system is ratcheted up that's what caffeine will do it needs to do the opposite for you to fall asleep that's why you can have what we call the tired but wired phenomenon where you say i'm so desperately tired i am so tired but i'm just so wired that i can't fall asleep it's because your nervous system is too amped up. Caffeine will trigger that amping up. Then at that point, if you're struggling to fall asleep because you've got too much caffeine on board, it is what we call anxiogenic. So now you start to worry. And the last thing you need to do when your head hits the pillow for good sleep is worry. Because when you start to worry, you start to ruminate. And when you ruminate, you catastrophize. And when you catastrophize, you're dead in the water for the next two hours when it comes to sleep. Because we have this sense that, you know, things at night, in the darkness of night, are so much bigger than they are in the brightness of day. 
and we start worrying. You know, in this modern era, we're constantly on reception. Very rarely do we do reflection. And unfortunately, the only time when we typically do reflection is when we turn off the light and our head hits the pillow. And that is the last time you want to be doing reflection. So that's the, the second problem with caffeine. It's anxiogenic. And it only makes you sort of almost like the Woody Allen neurotic of the sleep world. The final part of caffeine is that it's very good at blocking your deep sleep. So we've done a number of these studies where we'll give people a standard dose of caffeine, let's say 150 milligrams, 200 milligrams, which is probably, you know, a cup and a half of good, strong coffee. And then we put you to bed and we look at the amount of deep sleep and it will strip away your deep sleep by about somewhere between 15 to 30%. Now, to put that in context, to drop your deep sleep by 30%, I'd probably have to age you by about 40 years for zero. Or you could do it every night with an espresso with, with dinner. And that's one of the problems that people will say to me, look, I'm one of those people who I can have two espressos with dinner and I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. So no harm, no foul. Well, not necessarily, because even if you fall asleep and you stay asleep, you're not aware of the lack of the deep sleep that you're not getting because of the caffeine. And so now you wake up the next day and you think, well, I don't remember having a hard time falling asleep. I don't remember waking up, but now I'm reaching for two or three cups of coffee the next morning rather than my standard one cup of coffee because I don't feel refreshed and restored by my sleep because I was lacking the amount of deep sleep. Deep sleep is critical for regulating your cardiovascular system. It's the time when we do replenish the immune system. It also regulates your metabolic system, so it controls the hormones such as insulin that will regulate your blood sugar and you will become blood sugar dysregulated without sufficient deep sleep. Upstairs in the brain, deep sleep will um, strengthen and consolidate and secure new memories into your brain. They will prevent those memories from being forgotten. Deep sleep is also the time when we cleanse the brain of metabolic toxins, particularly the toxins that are related to Alzheimer's disease. So getting a lack of deep sleep is, I would say, a non-trivial thing um, in that regard. But I don't want to be also puritanical here, and this is where I'm going to change my title tune. I am not here to tell anyone how to live their life. I have no right to tell anyone how to live their life. I'm just a scientist. All I want to try and do is gift you the science and the knowledge of sleep so that you can make an informed choice. And after all, and the same is true for alcohol too and sleep, you know, life is to be lived to a certain degree. You know, no one wants to be the healthiest guy in the graveyard. <laughs> I don't want to be that way too. I want to live life just with moderation. The reason I don't drink uh, caffeine is not because uh, I'm so puritanical. I want to be the poster child of good sleep. I love the smell of freshly ground coffee in the morning. It's a great ritual. It's just that I've run my genetics and I am one of the slow caffeine metabolizers. So you can do these genetic kits online and they will tell you, are you a slow metabolizer or a fast metabolizer? So that's the variability. That's why some people will say, look, I'm pretty immune to caffeine and others will say I'm not. Um, why do I now favor coffee? I was actually quite anti caffeine in coffee when I first came out with the book, just looking at the studies. But now the data is immensely compelling. The health benefits associated with coffee are undeniable. Study after study after study, and we can put them all together in this big, what we call a meta-analysis study. And it is so strikingly clear that coffee, drinking coffee is a good thing for you from a health perspective. Two things to say about that. The first is that it's got nothing to do with the caffeine. And a lot of people have sort of rightly challenged me to say, look, you say how problematic sleep can be when you're drinking too much caffeine. But yet coffee is associated with many of the same health benefits that sleep is associated with. But coffee is supposed to hurt your sleep. How do you reconcile those two, <laughs> Matt Walker? And the answer is very simple, antioxidants. Because it turns out that the coffee bean contains a whopping dose of antioxidants. Things such as, uh, it's, well, it's got other things such as cafestol, but it's got a bunch of incredible antioxidants. Probably the most powerful of them 
in terms of the coffee bean is something called chlorogenic acid. Now, don't worry, it's not chlorine, it's not chloride, it's not bleach. A chlorogenic acid is very different. And what's happened in the modern world is that we, on, we have and struggle with our diet so much because we don't eat enough whole foods, etc. So what's happened is that the coffee bean has been now asked to carry the Herculean weight of all of our antioxidant needs on its shoulders. And where most people get the majority of their antioxidants is by way of drinking coffee. That's why coffee is associated with so many health benefits and it's not the caffeine. Case in point, if you look at the studies with decaffeinated coffee, you get very similar health benefits. Again, it's not the caffeine, it's the coffee itself. So the bottom line here is drink coffee, but I would say the dose and the timing make the poison. So try to limit yourself to about two cups of coffee, three cups of coffee maximum. Because if you look at the health benefits, by the way, it's a dose, it's not a dose response where at linear, where the more and more coffee you drink, the more and more healthy you become. It peaks at about two to three and then actually starts to go down in the opposite direction for lots of reasons that we can speak about. So right now, we don't typically advocate sleeping pills as the first line defense agent against or for insomnia as a treatment. In fact, in 2016, the American call, and again, this is me simply describing the science. This is me being descriptive of the science, not prescriptive in, in terms of medicine, because I'm not a medical doctor. Um, but in 2016, the American College of Physicians, they had an expert panel who surveyed all of the literature on classic sleeping pills. And what they suggested was that sleeping pills must no longer be the first line treatment for insomnia. It has to be cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or of course CBTI, which is a psychological intervention that we can speak about. But their recommendation was that they found, I think their wording was um, small and of questionable clinical importance in terms of the benefits of sleeping pills. Now, there is a time and a place for, in clinical medicine for sleeping pills but usually as an adjunct in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy. They are not advocated for long-term use, but so they're usually advocated for short-term use weeks. Most people are, have been on them for months, if not years, these classic sleeping pills. And that's a problem because those sleeping pills are in a class of drugs that we call the sedative hypnotics. And sedation is not sleep. For some subset of some people, there are some of these quote unquote sleep supplements that may benefit. But overall, the studies are very clear. None of them are efficacious. We all have a bad night of sleep. It doesn't mean that tomorrow you're going to wake up with depression or Alzheimer's disease. Don't worry, you're not going to get cancer, you know, tomorrow just because you've had a bad night of sleep. So we start to change people's misbeliefs about sleep and we try to get them back from being catastrophic about this idea of my not sleeping. So we that's the cognitive aspect. We start to lower their anxiety around the bed and, and the bedroom. We start to try to build confidence back. We start to reduce their expectations about, you know, what is reasonable sleep? Well, right now you're getting four or five hours of sleep and we can do better but don't start thinking that you need to get eight hours of sleep straight out the box. If you start to spend a lot of time awake in your bed, your brain is an incredibly associative device. And very quickly, it will start to learn that this thing called your bed is this place where I'm always awake. And therefore you start to learn through this repeated loop of behavior that I'm always going to be wide awake in bed. And we need to break that association. And that's why we say get out of bed after about 30 minutes, because you're just training your brain to think that this thing called my bed is the place where I'm never asleep. And we want to break that and only return to bed when you're sleepy. And there's no time limit for that. And that way, gradually, it's much better because you will relearn the association that your bed, just as when you were young, it was guaranteed that your bed is this place where you will always be asleep. If you're lying there awake, Firstly, by the way, if you're struggling with sleep, remove all clock faces from your bedroom. It's one of the best pieces of advice I can give you. Knowing what time of night it is, is no favor. So 
knowing now that it's 3.23 a.m. in the morning and I'm still struggling to fall asleep, and then I look back at the clock and it's now 4.03 a.m. and I've still been awake, and now it's 4.27 and I've got to wake up at 6.30 a.m., knowing that has no utility for you. Remove all clock faces from your bedroom. It is a gift. But coming back to the final suggestion, if you don't want to get out of bed, if you don't want to listen to a podcast, the final thing I would say is just accept and say, look, it's okay. Tonight is not my night. It is not the worst thing in the world. And instead of trying to sleep, all I'm going to do here is lie in bed and I'm just going to rest. Because wouldn't it be lovely if someone came to you in the middle of your work day you're just stressed and someone said by the way just come into this room there's a, there's a bed here just lie down and just rest for an hour wouldn't it be lovely just have a good old rest for an, an hour just rest there and i would say that if you can't sleep just lie in bed stop worrying about sleep and not being able to get it stop worrying about the next day just lie in there and enjoy a nice good old rest at this stage insufficient sleep seems to be one of the more or one of the most significant lifestyle factors that can develop or dictate the development of Alzheimer's disease later in life. Now, that's a lifestyle factor. There are other genetic factors, but certainly we now know that it's not just that insufficient sleep predicts a greater amount of Alzheimer's pathology in your brain. So for example, people who on average are sleeping six hours or less have a far higher magnitude of amyloid, of beta amyloid, which is the sticky toxic protein related to Alzheimer's disease, and another protein called tau protein. These are the two protein culprits of Alzheimer's. Both of those are escalate the less and less sleep that you have. Now that's just associational. We also know, by the way, that two sleep disorders, insomnia and sleep apnea, heavy snoring, both of those are associated with a marked increased risk of your Alzheimer's disease, uh, of Alzheimer's disease later in life. That's simply associational. That doesn't prove causality, but we now have the causal evidence, both in animal models and in human models. If I deprive a human being of sleep for a single night, or I even just deprive you of deep sleep, for a single night. The next day, we can see an immediate increase in these Alzheimer's disease-related proteins circulating in your bloodstream, circulating in what we call a cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain. And using special brain scans, we can even measure it within the brain itself. So these are causal manipulations. It's not associational. I manipulate this thing called sleep, and the consequence is that I manipulate your Alzheimer's disease proteins. That's correlation going to causation, then the question is, well, mechanism. What is it about sleep when you get it that is de-escalating Alzheimer's disease risk? In other words, when you don't get it, what? why would it increase your Alzheimer's risk? And this was a stunning discovery made by a scientist called Macon Nedegaard at the University of Rochester here in America. And she found three things. First, studying uh, mice and rats, she found that the brain has a cleansing system. Now, we didn't used to think that your brain had a cleansing system. Your body had one, and everyone knows what it's called. It's called the lymphatic system. Um, we didn't think the brain had one, but she discovered that the brain has one. It's called the glymphatic system, named after these glial cells that make it up. The second thing that she discovered is that that cleansing system within the brain is not always switched on in high flow volume across the 24 hour period. It was expressly during sleep and particularly during deep non-REM sleep when that sort of sewage system was put into overdrive and washed away all of this detritus that built up during the day. And the final thing that she discovered, and this is why it's related to Alzheimer's disease, is that two of the metabolic byproducts that build up during the day in our brain are beta amyloid and tau protein, the two bad actors in Alzheimer's disease. So in other words, what she discovered is a system of, you know, good night, sleep clean. That sleep is a power cleanse for the brain. And if you're not getting your sleep every night, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease next week. It doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, you know, in a year's time. But night after night, once again, it's like compounding interest on a loan. 
And that's why we now believe through this causal mechanism that insufficient sleep is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Lots of people will say to me, look, there are these individuals in society who claim that they, you know, didn't need very much sleep, who didn't sleep a lot. You know, Margaret Thatcher has often quoted me, uh, quoted to me about that. You know, um, uh, Ronald Reagan was apparently another short sleeper. I don't think it's coincidental that both Thatcher and Reagan went on to die of the unfortunate disease of Alzheimer's. The first thing I would recommend people to do, and this is why when some people say, oh, what about this new sleep supplement? Or, you know, it's, it's 40 quid for this bottle of these sleep, new sleep natural medications. So I'm going to give it a try. I would say try these tried and true things first before you spend your money on supplements. First thing is regularity. Go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend. Your brain expects regularity. It thrives best under conditions of regularity. When you give it regularity, you can improve the quantity and the quantity of your sleep. The second thing is get some darkness at night. As I said, we don't get enough darkness in the modern world. And so the trick I would offer, and I don't use it, I don't like the word hack, but the sort of suggestion would be in the last hour before bed, try this experiment for everyone listening for the next week dim down half of the lights or switch off half of the lights or even a qu three quarters of the lights in your home in the last hour before bed just dim down you know switch off half of the lights you will be surprised at how sleepy that darkness will make you feel and it's also an incredible behavioral trigger to signal to your brain that it is time for sleep, that darkness is around me. That's the second tip, is darkness. The third tip is temperature. Most people sleep in an ambient bedroom temperature that is too high. And you need to aim for a bedroom temperature of about 18, 18 and a half degrees Celsius, around about 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm uh, probably butchering the, the mathematics there on that, but um, you need to get cool. Now you can wear thick socks, you can have a hot water bottle, that's fine, but the ambient needs to be cold because you need to drop your core body temperature and your brain temperature by about one degree Celsius to fall asleep and stay asleep. And it's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. So make your bedroom cold, make it dark like a cave. The, the fourth question would be sort of what we've, or fourth suggestion would be walk it out. And we've spoken about this, the 30 minute rule, you know, get up, do something different or meditate. You know, don't lie in bed awake for too long. Then the final two things we've spoken about, well, we've spoken about caffeine. We haven't spoken about alcohol, but let me just say as the kind of headline of it, alcohol is not a sleep aid. Many people use it as a sleep aid. It is not your friend. Alcohol again is a sedative, so it knocks you out. The second is that it fragments your sleep. So you wake up, your sleep is littered with all of these small awakenings. Most of them you don't remember because they're too brief, but it makes for miserable, lousy quality sleep. And the final thing is that it, alcohol is very good at blocking your REM sleep or your dream sleep, which we know is critical for many other functions as well. So alcohol is not your friend. It turns out that the blue light from screens does have an impact on sleep. So there's a great study done by Harvard Medical School by some colleagues there. And they showed that reading for an hour on an iPad just before bed, relative to just reading a book in dim light. Firstly, it delayed the time with which people fell asleep. So it took them a lot longer to fall asleep. Second, it reduced the total amount of sleep that they had. Third, it decreased a sleep-related hormone called melatonin. It delayed the release of that melatonin and it reduced the amount of melatonin. And finally, it reduced the amount of rapid eye movement sleep. It signals to your brain that it's nighttime, that it's darkness. And so your brain needs the signal of melatonin for it to understand when is it dark. In other words, it needs to understand by way of melatonin when it is time to fall asleep. And when you're bathed in electric light at night, and especially when you're getting blue light from these devices, your brain is fooled into thinking it's still daytime. And when there is light emitting through your retina, coming into your brain, it signals to a part of your brain to hit the brakes on melatonin and your brain will not release melatonin. 
So what was happening with this iPad reading is that you were artificially telling the brain it's still daytime and the brakes on melatonin were still shut on. And so melatonin was not starting to be released until much later. And what was also interesting about that study, by the way, is that when they stopped the iPad reading, the sleep disrupted pattern continued for several days later. Oh, In other words, it was almost like a drug that it had a washout period that was a blast radius to it. Now, there's been some great work by a wonderful sleep scientist in uh, Australia, uh, Michael Gradazar, and he has added to this story. And he said, it's not just the blue light. These devices, the principal function of these devices is that they are attention capture devices. Just like you said, I'm just gonna have a wee little TikTok before bed. They are in the attention economy and all they care about is capturing your attention for current currency and they make a lot of money from it. What that attention does is that it stimulates your brain. And when your brain is stimulated, it's very difficult for you to fall asleep and it creates what we call sleep procrastination where you're lying in bed and you could be perfectly sleepy and you could fall asleep right now. But then you sort of check social media and you think, oh, I'll just shoot that last email. Oh, and then I'll order that last thing on sort of, you know, Amazon. Uh, and then you get a text back from your friend and you start texting them. And, and then you look up and it's now an hour later and you're an hour deficient on sleep. So it's the activation of your cerebral cortex by these devices that is perhaps the more harmful aspect of them regarding your sleep. Now, here again, I don't want to be finger wagging. You know, the genie of technology is out the bottle and it's not going back in any time soon. There's nothing that I'm going to say as a sleep researcher that's gonna change that. I don't take my phone into my bedroom. I put my phone uh, out in the kitchen and I don't uh, see it until morning, but lots of people do and fair enough. But there's another rule uh, that I've stolen from another friend. He has this great rule regarding technology and it's the following, that if you really must take your phone into your bedroom, you can only use it standing up. And what you'll find is that after about six or seven minutes standing up, you think, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit down on the bed. And at that point, as soon as your backside hits the bed, you're done. So the first emerging evidence came in terms of um, hormones. So there are what we call appetite regulating hormones. And the two principal ones of concern here are something called leptin and ghrelin. Now leptin, when it's released, will signal to your brain that you're satisfied with your food, you are satiated, and you are no longer hungry. Ghrelin does the opposite. When ghrelin is released, it says, no, you're not satisfied with your food, you are not full, you still want to eat more, you are still hungry. And some of the first studies, they started to uh, just limit people, restrict people's sleep to six hours or five hours or four hours. And what they found was that um, there was, firstly, that signal leapt in that says, no, you're satisfied with your food, you don't want to eat anymore, you're full. That signal of fullness, satiation, was decreased by 18%. If that wasn't bad enough, ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, that leapt up by 28%. Overall hunger levels rose by about uh, 26%. So firstly, you are it's almost like double jeopardy that you are getting punished twice for the same crime of not sleeping enough. Once by losing the signal of I'm full, I, I don't want to eat anymore. And once again, for the, no, I'm much more hungry and I'm just going to overeat, which is ghrelin. So what that produces is a profile of increased eating. So on average, underslept individuals started to eat in those studies about three to 400 extra calories at each, sit at each sitting by way of insufficient sleep. Then what they discovered is that it's not just that you want to eat more, it's what it is that you have a craving for when you are underslept. And this is the problem. What they found is that when you are underslept, you eat more of everything, but you especially eat more of these heavy hitting stodgy carbohydrates, bread, pasta, pizza. The, the next thing that you started to eat, have a preference for was simple sugary foods, sweets and chocolate. And then finally you started to crave very salty food 
and high sodium food intake will increase your blood pressure. So that was the first of the, the three mechanisms. Then we did a study where we said, perhaps it's not just the circulating hormones in the body. The brain is the ultimate arbiter of your food decisions. So what's going on in the brain? So we took a group of perfectly healthy individuals and we put them through the experiment twice. Once when they'd had a full eight hours of sleep and once when we deprived them of sleep. And then the next day we placed them inside an MRI scanner and we showed them images of lots of different foods that range from being sort of, you know, very healthy to being very unhealthy and sort of ice cream and, you know, chocolate and pizza and things to leafy salads and nuts and greens and vegetables. And we asked them to rate how much they wanted that food for each item. Now we did something a bit dis sort of dastardly to make it more ecologically correct so that they weren't just saying, okay, they probably think I should probably say that's healthy. We said, we're gonna randomly select one of these images, these food images that you see. And after you get out the brain scanner, we're gonna give you that food and we're going to politely ask you to eat it all. So it made it a bit more realistic. So the choices were more, you know, as much as that we could. So what we found is that when they were sleep deprived, the deep hedonic centers, the emotional centers of the brain, these desire centers, these reward centers, uh, they ramped up in their activity in response to these highly desirable, highly unhealthy foods. So these more basic sort of, you know, guttural parts of the brain, as it were, um, these reward centers were lighting up much more strongly when you were sleep deprived. Worse still, the impulse control regions in the front of the brain, what we call the prefrontal cortex, they were shut down, they were taken offline. So as a consequence, you lost your impulse control. And that's why you start to then say, you know, when I'm sleep deprived at the food sort of buffet, I'm not, I'm not gonna do salad. I'm just gonna, that pizza looks awful good or that pasta with the cream. I'm just gonna go into that all go. So, so you're, it's what we call a pattern in terms of brain activity uh, in neuroscience of hedonic eating, that your brain goes into this hedonic desire profile. So now we understood it's not just hormones in the body, it's also changes in the brain. Then came the finding that there's another chemical in the body that's responsible. And this comes on to cannabis. <laughs> when people, um, uh, uh, when people, when people that you may know have smoked uh, cannabis, they'll often say, I get viciously hungry. I get the munchies, I get really hungry. That's no coincidence because cannabis will stimulate appetite. Now we all have naturally occurring cannabis compounds in our brain and our bodies. They are called endocannabinoids. Endo meaning comes from inside us. Um, whereas the cannabis that comes externally when you sort of smoke it or um, take edibles. So endocannabinoids do many things for the brain and the body, but one of the things that they do is control your appetite and your hunger. And what we found is that when you sleep deprived individuals, these naturally occurring endocannabinoids rocketed up by over 20%, cranking up people's appetite. Mm. And so these three ways lead you to start packing on, you know, when insufficient sleep is occurring, when sleep gets short, your waistline typically starts to expand. If you're not getting sufficient sleep, then 60% of all of the weight that you lose will come from lean muscle mass oh God, no. and not fat. Not the muscle. I know exactly. So in other words, when you are dieting, but you are underslept, you lose what you want to keep, which is muscle, and you keep what you want to lose, which is fat. So again, it's I'm sold. not an ideal situation. I think the only other area that fascinates people even more than sleep is dreaming. So dreaming above and beyond the stage of which it comes from, which is principally called rapid eye movement sleep or dream sleep, REM sleep provides a set of physiological and uh, benefits, but dreaming we've now discovered even above and beyond that provides benefits and it provides at least two benefits. The first is creativity. I was telling you that during deep sleep, you cement individual memories, you grab memories and you shift them from a short-term storage reservoir to a long-term storage reservoir. 
and you strengthen the circuit of those memories so you future-proof information. But that's individual memories. What we discovered is that sleep is much more intelligent than you ever thought possible. That it's during REM sleep and particularly during dreaming that we take all of the individual pieces of information that we've been learning and we start interconnecting them and associating them with all of our back catalog of stored information. And so what dream sleep, one of the functions of dream sleep is to cross link and associate new memories together. So you wake up the next day having, after dream sleep, with a revised mind web of associations. And those are capable of divining solutions to previously impenetrable problems. So think of dreaming as, it's almost like informational alchemy that you start to fuse things together that shouldn't normally go together. But when they do, they cause marked advances in your thinking, in your productivity, in your ingenuity. And in that way, you go to sleep with the pieces of the jigsaw, but you wake up with the puzzle complete. And I would argue that that's the difference between knowledge, which is remembering the individual pieces, and wisdom, which is knowing what it all means when you fit them together. That's one of the functions of dreaming. It's the reason, by the way, that you've never been told to stay awake on a problem. Sleep. The other function of dreaming uh, that we know of is that dreaming provides a form of emotional first aid that we've, we've done a lot of work and we came up with a, a theory that was called uh, dreaming as overnight therapy. And what we've discovered is that when we go into dream sleep, particularly based on its neurochemical profile and its physiological anatomy of the brain, um, the dreaming brain will take difficult, painful experiences, sometimes traumatic experiences, and it will essentially strip away the bitter emotional rind from the informational orange. So let's take a step back. What makes a memory emotional? What makes a memory emotional is that at the time of the experience, that experience triggered a strong visceral reaction. And that visceral reaction is useful to the brain and it wraps that experience in this blanket of what we call emotion. It red flags it and prioritizes it in the brain. So now you've created a, a memory of an emotional event. In other words, you've cr created an emotional memory. But what dream sleep does is then it takes that useful emotional memory and it will detox the emotion from the memory. It strips the bitter emotional rind from the informational orange. Mm. It's almost, uh, and that's why we called it overnight therapy. So that the next day you come back and now you feel better about those experiences. So you have a memory of an emotional event but is no longer emotional itself. You don't regurgitate that same visceral reaction that you had at the time of learning. So the brain has done this elegant trick of stripping the emotion from the memory. So it's, that's, this, that's this, the second benefit um, is that it provides, it's not time that heals all wounds. It is time during sleep and particularly during dream sleep that provides emotional convalescence. Within my profession and with this field of sleep, I feel very comfortable. I'm reticent to say confident and my heart rate will be very stable. I probably, I, I feel more myself on stage alone in front of thousands of people than I do at any other time in my life. That's where I feel most myself.